of course, uh, the, the guy who started it all off um, in Norwich, uh, he stood in Nor- Norwich South and uh, Norwich North. He was accused uh, by um, Charles Clark, the Home Office Minister now, he was accused of uh, trying to s- disrupt the electoral process. Uh, presumably by trying to get votes, you know, so that Charles Clark couldn't get them. Um, I've got to go up against Charles Clark this year, and I, I hope he says that to me. <laughs> he stood, as well as uh, Norwich South, he also stood in Norwich North, because you can stand in more than one constituency. You can't actually take more than one seat, but you can stand in more than one constituency. So I'd like you to welcome, please, the man who stood in Norwich South, Norwich North, Southampton Test, and Neath. Mr. Nice, Howard Marks. Hello. All right. I'm really sorry I couldn't be here earlier and hear what uh, I've been told has been some, what a series of very interesting talks. Sorry about that, yeah. I've been in a hospital in Mallorca and barely made it, I promise you. But I'm going to take this off because I'm hot. So I hope I don't kind of, and it's a hell of a tendency to do this sort of thing, just to reiterate the same old thing over and over again. Um, so I'll try and summarize that bit and uh, try to get on to, uh, you know, what I think uh, some issues about the whole problem that we perhaps ought to concentrate on a bit more, okay? Now, starting very, very simply, cannabis exists, okay? It exists. Some people want to take it. Right? That's the situation we're faced with. A plant exists, and some people want to consume it for various reasons, okay? Either to get off their heads, or to be gently relaxed, or to enhance their enjoyment of things like music and other things, or to alleviate pain, their suffering, and do not wish to suffer, and don't really care about the long-term medical possibilities of smoking. Now, cannabis exists. Some people want to take it. Authority does not want people to take it. Never mind why. Authority doesn't want people to take it. And it has adopted the strategy of cannabis prohibition, rendering as illegal its trade and use for any purpose. Authority has attempted to rid the planet of cannabis. Okay. It appears though that God or nature or some equally significant entity has done a very good job of furnishing the earth with all manner of different strains of cannabis. Authority has attempted to persuade people not to take cannabis. No effect. When public revenues are allocated to advertising campaigns pleading with people not to break the law, then clearly one aspect of social consensus has broken right down. Authority has imposed vicious, cruel, and extremely harsh penalties, always increasing and now imprisoning mere users of cannabis at the rate of over 1,000 a year, and advocating even life imprisonment and the return of the death penalty. Now let's think about that. One Tory MP by the name of David Evans suggested in Parliament that the death penalty be brought back to deal with users of cannabis. LA Police Chief Daryl Gates wanted cannabis users to be electrocuted. The U.S. drug czar, William Bennett, all of these things you notice we follow, both in the stupid names we use for the titles and the policies. William Bennett also 
wanted the death penalty for users. Now this is what we are up against. I am absolutely cool about calling that lot my enemy. Authority spends massive and constantly increasing budgets enforcing its policy of cannabis prohibition. You'll have heard the figures, I'm sure. A lot of money, a lot of taxpayers' money pouring into this machinery to stop people taking cannabis. Don't seem to be working too well, though, does it? Surveys of young people carried out between 1993 and a year ago show cannabis use ranging from 53% at the minimum to 96%. I mean, like, it depends on the sample. I think the 53% were students at Oxbridge. The 96%, I think, were readers of some dance magazines. But, you know, it's varying between that. Two-thirds of all registered voters under the age of 25 regularly take cannabis. Coming from me, you know this is true. It's easy to smuggle cannabis into this country. It's easy to grow cannabis in the back garden, in the wardrobe. People sell cannabis because it's easy to sell cannabis. The profits are high. The risks of getting caught are low. I think this obviously and clearly means that cannabis prohibition doesn't work, even from the point of view of those who are trying to prohibit it. Never mind our point of view. Let's put ourselves in their shoes. No, it's not working, even from their point of view. Apart from not beginning to achieve its aims, no matter how bad we think those aims are, no matter how awful we think they are, apart from not beginning to achieve those aims, prohibition also makes cannabis artificially expensive and spawns an absolute avalanche of acquisitive criminal behavior. Growing cannabis is easy. But as it has to be sold on the black market, those who trade in it risk being sent to prison. Or find. They charge sometimes a lot of money for their trouble. The cannabis business has become so profitable that people have been known to have fights, sometimes violent fights, over territories in which to sell cannabis. More in America than here, but to some extent here too. These people could actually afford to buy guns. It's hard to think of as a cannabis dealer having a gun, but it could happen. Guns are bad, I think. Once a country is full of guns, they're not going to go away. Across the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America, civil war after civil war has actually been funded by the only strategy available to revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries alike, the mass production of their traditional cannabis for sale to the absurdly lucrative global market. That's cannabis prohibition at work. The prohibition of naturally occurring cannabis has resulted in super skunk. Okay, I'm cool about that, but <laughs> compare that to the cases of legal alcohol and tobacco. I actually went into a pub in Welling Garden City and saw a bottle of non-tox, non-tox alcohol, i.e. alcohol without any alcohol. I can smoke cigarettes with absolutely microscopic amounts of tar in them, right? That's what happens when you legalize, okay? You have a greater availability of weaker 
versions of the substance available. So prohibition has not only overseen vastly increased use, it has also engendered a several-fold increase in the potency of the substance they are trying to prohibit. Worse than that, prohibition actually poisons. There are no controls in a black market, so cannabis might be mixed with dangerous substances. It is. I've seen it. I've seen it happening. I've seen plastic hardening agents pushed into hashish in Morocco. These plastic hardening agents, you smoke them. They vaporize, get down into your lungs, recondense, and cause tissue damage. They don't get you stoned at all. I don't want to smoke those things. Okay? But that's what we are smoking when we buy our average Moroccan stuff on the street. Also, they put in chemicals to make the outside of the hash hard and shiny. They put chemicals in there to make it burn so that the innocent dope smoker, good flame, probably good hash, no, petrol. So cannabis prohibition has made cannabis stronger, more dangerous, and has failed completely to reduce its use. Cannabis prohibition increases any harm that might be caused by cannabis use. Cannabis cannot cause crime. It can only do so through interaction in a social context. That social context is prohibition and the consequent black market. Cannabis prohibition, therefore, is a root cause of crime, violence, and ill health. It's no wonder that cannabis prohibition policies promote utter disrespect for the rule of law. And this could be the greatest threat of them all. The increasing numbers of cannabis users make larger and larger fractions of the population cavalier as regards the rule of the law. Already criminalized for their habits, their threshold for breaking the law is dramatically lowered and leads to the disrespect for other laws can't help that process happening. According to Rousseau, according to Rousseau, the social contract society arises from an agreement between the citizens and an elected subgroup of them, the state, in exchange for upholding their liberties by the rule of law. The citizens agree to empower the state by paying it taxes. Insufficient law will yield anarchy. For example, the American firearms laws. Okay. Yield anarchy. Excessive law will yield tyranny, like you have in Iranian religious law, I suppose. Western jurisdictions have always sought the optimum by forbidding those acts harmful to others, but allowing all those that are not, including any that are harmful to oneself. That was first applied officially by someone called von Humboldt in 1810 and became to be known as the Consenting Adults in Private Legislation. Prostitution, homosexuality are not crime. Because of that, even suicide is no longer a crime. Now, some people bungee jump. Others parachute, hang glide, climb mountains, race cars, horses, walk tight ropes, go fasting for several days. Authorities have no problem with any of that. They don't mind my getting high from jumping off a cliff. But don't smoke cannabis. Cannabis prohibition is in control. It should not be equated with control. It is simply the abrogation of control leading to unregulated peddling 
of adulterated cannabis outside the reach of the law. It will be difficult to construct, even if one deliberately contrived to do so. A policy more physically dangerous, more individually criminalizing, or more socially destructive. Cannabis prohibition is an extremely dangerous failure and should be dismantled as soon as possible. Now we all know this, I think. I think that's why we're here. I've said nothing new at all. Okay. That's why we're here. So sorry for wasting your time so far. Perhaps I ought to ask, what can we do? Right? What can we do about it? We know it's wrong. We know it's absolutely hideously sinister and evil. We know that. Okay. What can we do? See, like as Alan said, I stood for Parliament here at Norwich in 1997. And it's hard work, actually. Okay? It is hard work. And that's why I take my hat off to everyone that I heard Alan mentioning who stand in for Parliament again. It's hard work. Okay? It really is. Because, you see, there are many people who want to legalize cannabis. And they all hold different views, different political beliefs, or different religious beliefs from each other. They're united for one moment in this hall. Yes, we all want to legalize cannabis. And on the way back is your Trotsky bastard. You're right. Well, you know, so it happens. It's hard. Because you see, and this was one of the sources of many arguments and is and constantly is at the crux of the problem with why maybe we're not getting forward too quickly. You see, all the arguments that I outlined above against prohibition show the, policy, show the folly of prohibition not only for cannabis, but for all recreational substances. I'm trying not to get at the drug herb, herb thing at the moment. It's recreational substances. The same arguments apply. You see, for many people, the problem with legal cannabis use is part of the whole illegal drug use problem. It is part of a larger moral disorder that needs to be reformed from one perspective or the other. To these people, whether they are against cannabis legalization or not, to these people who've got this whole view of it, dealing with cannabis separately is too narrowly focused, a betrayal, if you like, of broader principles. Those supporting the legalization of all drugs are absolutely shit scared that if cannabis itself was just re-legalized, they would lose their largest body of support. I happen, myself, to favor the legalization of all drugs. I happen to. That is my own personal opinion. Not everyone here does. And after all, this is the Legalized Cannabis Alliance, not the Legalized All Drugs Alliance. So the first step we, I think now, as the LCA should do, is to put all our energy to make cannabis a special case and to determine sensibly what makes it a special case. Okay? Because a lot of people will have different reasons for legalizing cannabis. They will come from it with different points of view. I know some people who want to prohibit hard drugs like cocaine, heroin, LSD, prohibit them, and feel that they could better prohibit them if law enforcement efforts were taken away from cannabis and put into them. They would be more effective at stopping these hard drugs going, so they would favor the legalized cannabis policies just to hit the hard drug people harder. Okay? Those people tend to be very different from those people who want to legalize all drugs, including, in their mind, cannabis. Okay? Different people. But no matter which side of that one we happen to be on here, let's forget it. Okay? We are trying to legalize cannabis. Let's forget everything else for the moment. What makes cannabis special? Why is it any different 
from any of these other psychoactive substances. Why? Well, firstly, its illegality can be shown simply by reading what happened this century early on. It's based on ignorance. Okay? Cannabis was made illegal in this country in the 1920s. Anyone who's read the Egyptian delegate's speech would readily agree, I think, that the League of Nations had insufficient evidence to justify including cannabis in its legislative framework for curbing international trade in opium and cocaine, as it did in 1925. But although it would have been infinitely preferable had the League of Nations never included cannabis in the Geneva Convention. Governments today have to respond to the situation they find themselves in now, not the situation that might have existed if their predecessors had been wiser or better informed. Okay, so this Egyptian stood up, said a lot of complete shite, and the whole world went for it, and whoosh, cannabis was made illegal. Now, you see, you've got to look at that in its context, too. See, in the early decades of the century, there was a strong movement towards state control and prescription, generally. All right, let's get tough on them all, generally. And an extension of the medical umbrella to eliminate all sorts of practices which were seen as uncivilized or standing in the way of progress. Now, civilized at that time was uncritically construed as white, Christian and alcohol drinking. That's what civilized meant. Then. Not only by the West, but also by progressive regimes like Egypt and Turkey, both of whom were keen to enter the 20th century after their First World War collapse. And both of whose leaders were happy to stigmatize cannabis use, along with the wearing of fezes, the use of Arabic names, and other medieval anachronisms. Now, this allowed the Western nations then to claim with some credibility that the whole world supported the project of making cannabis illegal. Now today, right, we are, I hope, multicultural and have, I hope, abandoned the racial science that underpinned the invention of the cannabis law. The ideas of these laws protecting white people from contamination by ethnic minorities now seems silly. Carrying on the cannabis law is carrying on the racial intolerance that underlies it. Continuing the cannabis law is straightforward racism. Also, it seems silly, I think, that civilization can somehow or other be achieved by state brutalism and the, pers and the suppression of personal freedoms. I don't think it ever can. What else makes cannabis special? There's that one. The whole thing is based on ignorance and racism. Isn't that enough reason to throw it out the window? But the next thing that makes cannabis a special case is its widespread use, okay? Like I referred to earlier on, a lot of people are taking cannabis. But you see, many other forms of law-breaking, for example, negligent environment pollution by large companies, are so extensive to be virtually unpoliceable, okay? Totally unpoliceable. But the effort to prevent it is obviously constructive and worthwhile. So the widespread use is not enough in itself. Okay? That's not enough in itself until it becomes the vast majority of people, which it isn't yet. It's hovering around the 50%. Its widespread use is not enough by itself to justify abandoning the law, preventing it. Next, what makes cannabis special is its relative harmlessness. There are thousands of medical papers written to demonstrate that cannabis is harmful. 
Now, most of these, particularly written by that lunatic Frenchman, Nahus, have been thoroughly discredited by the scientific community. We don't have to worry. And most reports of health risks through taking cannabis have so far been straight nonsense and might as well have been concocted by that same Egyptian guy. Certainly the standards of proof required to demonstrate the harmlessness, the harmless nature of cannabis are untenably high. Higher than for any pharmaceutical drug. Higher than for any other recreational activity. Higher than for any sport. But, see, some medical reports, despite that wonderful Lancet statement saying that long-term use didn't seem to be harmful, there are some medical reports kicking around that haven't yet been totally discredited. And these will be grabbed on, okay, by those people who are nervous about allowing cannabis to be used. So let's not pretend because it's silly that it is totally harmless to anyone who takes it. I know people who it's obvious they shouldn't be smoking dope. Okay? I know them. All right? It is not definitely the cure-all and panacea for every one of us in whatever situation. I'm lucky. I don't know any situation I don't prefer to be stoned in. But I'm lucky. All right? It might not be the case for everyone. We do not want to force it down because of its relative harmlessness. The other thing that makes cannabis special is that not only is it based on ignorance, it is also based on the fraud of the gateway or escalation theory. That is that cannabis is a gateway to harder, more injurious substances, all of which apparently are invested with the power to enslave the curious. The whole process of escalation itself, having some sort of fatal inevitability about it, that it entraps even the most iron-bound will in its tentacles. I'm not going to even talk about the gateway theory, all right? If there's anyone alive who still believes that, I don't know what to suggest. Another important special thing about cannabis is that there exists a place called Amsterdam <laughs> where a cannabis-taking culture is available for study, analysis, and concluding and has been for the last quarter of a century. It doesn't apply to any of the other recreational drugs. Anyone who wants to see what it's like to smoke cannabis can go to Amsterdam and see. Finally, and I've left this to the last because it's probably the most important, there are the therapeutical benefits. We can't surely continue to deny those those therapeutical benefits to people suffering from multiple sclerosis and other diseases? What? Do I want to be part of a society that stops these people getting that? No. Now, I'm going to stop in a second because I'm going to get out of breath and knock it. When these matters okay, were brought to the attention of Jack Straw, the Home Secretary, the man in charge of the legal system, the prison system, and all our laws, he stated, and these are his exact words, what I regard, can't do his accent, I'm afraid, but <laughs> thank God, but, what I regard as so irresponsible about those who say we should decriminalize possession of small amounts of cannabis is one thing which would follow as night follows day, is that consumption would shoot up. Now, although at first in Holland the exact opposite happens, so the night following day thing is not true at all, but if cannabis, okay, I mean, listen to the sense of this remark, if cannabis was being declared generally accessible once more, 
Why should the fact that taxpayers were now exercising a right that was being restored to them need to be seen as undesirable? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a bit like extending the pub hours and then bemoaning the fact that someone's still there at midnight. I mean, it, if an act of public policy is right, why would its enactment be accompanied by the hope that as few people as possible should benefit from it. That makes sense. I'm going to stop there, okay, but I'll gladly answer any questions that anyone might have. Thanks a lot, yeah.